Good morning and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee, and today we are joined by Council Member uh, Grudenchek. If you are here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the Sergeant at Arms indicating your full name, the application name, or the LU number, and whether you are in favor or against the proposal. Uh, as a preliminary point of information, I would like to note that LUs 564 through 567 for the La Hermosa proposal and pre-considered LUs 561 and 562 for the 101 Fleet Place rezoning proposal are being laid over. Uh, we will now move on to our hearings. Uh, we will now hear LU 581 for the uh, POP signage and amenities text amendment relating to the various zoning districts citywide in multiple council districts. The proposal is by the Department of City Planning and consists of zoning text amendments related to signage and amenities in privately owned public spaces or POPs. The proposal aims to facilitate updates to the, public, to the official public space symbol of signage, requiring signage for various types of POPs and allows for movable tables and chairs for public use within plazas and arcades where they are currently prohibited. I now open the public hearing on this application uh, and I will now call up the first panel, which is uh, Stella Kim and Eric Botsford. Council, please swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Thank you. Just make sure that your microphone is turned on. Thank you. And you may begin when ready. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Stella Kim, and I'm here to present, um, of course, in favor of this uh, text amendment before you. And I'm Eric Botsford, Deputy Director of the Manhattan Office of the Department of City Planning. And I serve as the Program Manager for the Privately Owned Public Spaces at the Department of City Planning. So today um, I will walk you through the text amendment related to POP signage and amenities. Um, and as I'm sure you're familiar with and was introduced, POPs is an acronym for privately owned public spaces, both indoor and outdoor spaces located in the densest areas of our city. Um, provided for public enjoyment by private property owners, primarily in exchange for bonus floor area or other zoning concessions. Today we have over 550 of these spaces at over 350 buildings across the city, primarily in Manhattan, um, but also a growing presence in Brooklyn and Queens. This incentive zoning tool was first introduced in 1961 in the zoning resolution in the form of these plazas and arcades pictured on the left. Um, and these had very minimal standards. Since the regulations and design standards for these POPs have been improved upon and greatly evolved over the decades, um, the latest uh, major overhaul was in 2007 with the follow-up in 2009 that came before City Council. The department makes a continual effort to enhance these design standards so that POPs are of highest quality, useful, and inviting to the public. Signage really helps uh, the public know about these spaces um, and they're, that they're open for all to use. But they only became required at plazas beginning in 1975 when the department uh, first created robust standards for amenities and plazas with the urban plaza um, uh, introduction to the zoning. These spaces cr created prior to them are grandfathered under the prior standards, so for decades many of these spaces went unidentified to passerbys. Um, and that is about 40% of the properties um, that have POPs do not and still do not have signage today. But in 2007, um, City Council uh, put forward legislation related to uh, POP signage to address this issue and enforcement issues with POPs. And the city adopted a local law that requires public space signage now in all POPs regardless of any grandfathered zoning. And the department is very excited that these POPs will now all have signage, and this has opened up an opportunity to look anew at the signage um, and the identity for POPs. So earlier this year, the department with the Advocates for Privately Owned Public Spaces and the Municipal Art Society of New York held a design competition for a new POPs logo to be displayed on um, all POPs signage moving forward, and the competition was a huge success. We received over 600 submissions from about 60 countries across the world, and heard um, from the public on um, 
what they wanted to see as the next POPs logo as well. And here's our winner, which was chosen by Director Lago from three competition finalists. And so as you can see here, the logo really emphasizes, of course, the use of seating, which the department um, has always held as a really important amenity in these public spaces. Um, the um, provision of seating really invites the public to come in, to use a space, to stay and linger um, and um, enjoy these pops. However, in the original plaza standards, um, again, it was very minimal. It was about light and air reaching the street level. So there wasn't any requirements for amenities, nor are they permitted today. Um, and so, and also they're not allowed in arcades. And with this new emphasis on seating, on the signage, and thinking about how th our public spaces can be better improved, we'd like to unlock the potential for seating to be allowed in these older plazas and arcades so that they um, could be more inviting and useful to the public. This is really huge for us and we really look forward to spaces like the ones on the left of these grandfathered old plazas becoming more activated with seating um, like our plazas, new plazas are today, like on the right. So in sum, the department is putting forward um, a zoning tax amendment to update the provisions related to um, uh, pops with amenities and signage so that we can essentially update the logo with the newly chosen logo, ensure all pops have the required signage, and allow for plazas and arcades to include public amenities where they're currently prohibited. The text was filed in May and then referred to community districts and boroughs where the plaza bonus is currently available as identified in the turquoise on the left hand um, map and also a few additional community boards implicated by special zoning districts that reference existing public plaza standards um, as listed on the right. Separate but related, the department um, is also amending its rules in conjunction with this text amendment um, as um, allowed by the, the local law that was passed that will, that the goal is to provide specifications for the required signage and time frames to comply. So um, again, the, the text was referred to the um, reference community boards and borough, borough boards and presidents for 60 days. And uh, we heard back from eight community boards and two borough presidents and overall received um, very positive comments and support. And now we'll walk through some of the comments, uh, specific comments we got from a few community boards. So Manhattan Community Board 1 um, wanted to approve only if the existing logo is maintained. Um, and for five, they had concerns about um, unlimited number of movable tables and chairs obstructing pedestrian circulation. In, um, of course, CB5 being in Midtown where there's a lot of pedestrians um, in and out of the district. Um, we think for this one that um, the text adequately guards for the proposed um, is adequately guarded for because it has provisions about required clearances around circulation paths and entrances. Um, and also keeping in mind that these movable tables and chairs are movable, we're not allowing uh, fixed obstructions um, in these plazas. And from our experience from the decades of working on these um, different plazas and seeing them used and built, we haven't seen an overcrowding of movable tables and chairs um, in these spaces. So we don't think that this is, um, you know, sh should be a problem with this text. And for signage locations, appropriate signage locations from Community Board 5, we will be looking at that through our signage review, which um, is required by the departmental rule that is uh, moving forward. And CB6 had um, a suggestion to allow movable planters where tables and chairs are not practical for space reasons. And for space constrained spaces, uh, we think movable planters um, might be more problematic actually because planters first must be positioned strategically for growth and success. And often for soil volume reasons, the, the planters will be bulkier than a movable table and chair. Um, and the bulky features um, could also cause circulation concerns in certain pops. Um, and to note that adding this movable table and chair clause 
or sorry, movable plants or claws would be out of scope. And generally there were compliance and enforcement issues raised um, by community board five and six. Um, we um, understand their concerns and we um, have seen an uptick on DOB's end in inspecting these plazas as charged by the local law um, to visit and inspect every POPs every three years. Um, so they seem to be really moving on that um, and have been issuing violations um, where appropriate. And we work, we have been and we still continue to work closely with them in providing data on all our POPs. Um, and in general for the public as well, we've um, really made an effort as well to um, clearly communicate um, that the, these POPs exist. We've had public campaigning, we have a public map um, that is on our department website. Um, and so we think that's a very valuable tool in empowering the public to know about these spaces and also um, community groups like community boards. Um, and with that, that is it, and we're happy to answer any questions or comments. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Rivera and Council Member Lansman. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, could you just clarify the intent of the amendment uh, in terms of the graphic, and is this primarily to enable future changes to the actual graphic? And does this mean, if you're given uh, thought to when, you might revisit the graphic again in the future? Yeah, so the um, text amendment, you know, there has the um, existing logo placed in it, the tree, um, and so to facilitate the update, um, we need to remove, to strike that tree from the logo. Um, and across the department, the few instances where we have other logos, the zoning does allow for an update of the logo, for example, the waterfront. And so we want the flexibility to update this logo now um, and then potentially in the future. We don't have plans to update the logo. We, I mean, we just selected this new one, um, but just allowing that flexibility as um, is um, available in the zoning. Um, I, I also think it's really important to note that the primary impetus behind this um, is to ensure that property owners design their signs and place the logo in exactly the way in which you see in this template here. Um, when it was simply just specified in the zoning resolution but left up to the interpretation of property owners and their signage designers, we saw a really wide variety of signs provided, in some cases um, signs designed in such a way that made it kind of difficult to identify these spaces as being open to the public. And so we have thought very carefully about the design of the sign and the logo, the words open to public, and we want to ensure that property owners use them exactly as intended. So having people download the file directly and use the file exactly as provided will ensure that kind of consistency for all of these spaces. Great. And in a somewhat related issue regarding some of the public spaces, uh, is the is the phenomenon of what is called the hostile architecture, um, which may not have been the focus here, but uh, has the department looked at, at at this issue and considered whether uh, and how it could address some of these tactics, which often seem at odds with uh, the goal of making these spaces more inviting. Well. I think this signage proposal is directly related to this notion of hostile architecture. Um, you know, one of the things that has been identified in the past is that many of these spaces um, are not clearly signaled as being open to the public um, or, you know, may have things like fences um, that prohibit uh, entry to the public. Consistent signage across all privately owned public spaces citywide um, will ensure that people understand that they have the right to enter into these spaces. Um, so we think that this is a really critical, uh, a critical tool to have uh, in, our, in our toolbox here. Going beyond that, the other things that were identified, um, such as uh, spikes on seating surfaces, for example, um, those are things that the zoning resolution has explicitly prohibited um, uh, since 2007. Um, so they are clearly not permitted um, on any surface where people can sit. It doesn't matter if it's required seating or you know just a, a planter ledge. Um, they are not permitted. Um, we 
aren't, you know, really, really uh, strict about this. If anybody were to ever come to us and, and try to show us a design that included these kinds of features, we would absolutely not uh, permit it. Um, so uh, I think we can also say that, you know, the Department of Buildings as part of their regular inspections of POPs um, do issue violations when they see these types of uh, uh, anti-sitting devices in plazas. So, you know, I think we're able to come at it from multiple angles with the Department of City Planning and the Department of Buildings to try to ensure that these are not present in our POPs. Great, and last question concerning uh, DOB enforcement of the design standards for POPs. Uh, could you please describe how DCP communicates with the DOB when a new POP, POPs comes online? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, when a new POPs is approved, um, as with all you know, approved applications by DCP, they'll be sent over to DOB. Um, we also have um, an export of our database that is available to DOB, so they're always in the know about all the latest POPs approvals and are able to easily find that kind of information. Um, and we have just a really open communication channel as well um, to answer any questions they have as they go about inspections or clarifying aspects of the zoning or providing, you know, files that they might need. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, turn it over to Council Member Prudencic. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. Is there a public map of all these sites? Yes. And where would that map be? Um, our POPs website is just nyc.gov slash POPs. And near the top of the page, you'll see a link to click on a map that will take you and to. And who maintains it? Is it city planning? Yes. And if I were to look on a map of Manhattan or wherever some of these other um, pops are, would that show up on Google Maps or do they, have we gotten that far yet? No, they're not available, but that, that is a good idea and something we've talked about. You know, okay, I, I think it would be something that city planning may want to explore mm -hmm. because you know every day we see especially tourists looking at their phones looking for directions and, and it's it's nice amenity um, and I uh, thank you for those answers and, thank and you just Mr. To Chairman. Know, from the map you can type in you know your address or I think there might even be like a current location locator so you can see your nearby public spaces from our map okay thank you yeah. thank you mr. chair I, I just want to understand on page nine of this um, slide presentation or uh, is a map of the city and, and then you have community uh, board uh, districts it looks like. Um, wh what, are the, what are the green uh, highlighted community districts? Does, does this only apply in those community boards? I'm, I just don't understand. Sure. Um, yes, the ones um, in the green teal color are community districts that have medium to high density um, underlying zoning districts that allow the bonus for arcades and plazas today. Um, so they're usually, you know, C6, um, in the C6 uh, zoning district or, or higher. But, but then, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but then following on that, the um, the text does apply more widely. The list of special zoning districts that's on the right-hand side, um, that, that goes beyond just the highlighted community districts there. So there is a, a broader applicability. Um, so for example, in Far Rockaway, this text is applicable as well because those special zoning rules reference the, these standards also. Are, are there any um, open uh, uh, spaces that are outside of these community districts? That, that uh, any, any uh, privately owned public spaces that are, that are outside of these community districts or are they just limited to these community districts? They are currently um, located um, in these districts um, for the zoning bonuses, except there's not any in the Bronx yet, even though the zoning does allow for it. Um, but we do, we are identifying um, further POPs to add to the database per the um, legislation that went forward um, that um, broadly defined more POPs. So that um, this map is solely focused on the POPs bonus and the underlying zoning, but there are further POPs that um, will be added to the database over time. And I'm sure as 
you know, for example, Bronx with um, um, this zoning here, maybe there'll be future pops there. If I am, um, so I represent a part of community board eight, well, and 12, which is not in, in green here. If, if there's a land use deal and, and I negotiate, we negotiate a um, uh, privately owned public space as part of that. Would these uh, uh, rules apply to that or to, to that property or, or do we have to negotiate that in addition to whatever else we negotiated? If, if it would be a public space that is provided pursuant to a land use action, a discretionary mm -hmm. land use action, um, that may not be considered a, uh, a zoning POPs because it's not you know, provided for as part of the zoning regulations. The local law that was passed by the council in 2017, as Stella mentioned, did have a more expansive definition of POPs that did include spaces that were, uh, that resulted from approval of land use actions. Um, so yes, it would be considered part of, of POPs. These rules would apply in that case as well. So, and, and we would ensure that the signage, for example, was, was located in those spaces. Got it, got it. Okay, and then this design, um, I see, it says here that there was a competition yes. and there were 607 submissions from 58 countries. There were 17,000 public votes. What, what, how, how was the, the final finalist decided? Was it the one with the most votes or how did, what was the relationship between the votes and the process? Sure, yeah, there was a um, panel of seven members um, that were selected to um, weigh in um, the, pub the top public votes, the three top public votes were forwarded to them, the panel had their selections, and they deliberated and chose three finalists together. Um, and then Director Lago um, had the um, decision-making power for the department to choose what will become the So the top, top seven vote getters went to the panel? Top, top three went to the to the panel. And the, there were seven panelist members who also had their own vote. So there was, you know, over 20 logos so or so that so they the, were deliberating. So the top three vote getters went to the panel. Yes. And then the panel forwarded to the commissioner what? Their, their three. Their, their top three from just their own deliberations. Oh, the I panel. get it. So there's the, there's the voters three, mm -hmm. there's the panels three. So yes. the commissioner was looking at six. Uh, no. The, so the, the top public, the three that went to the panel was just thrown into the large pool of all of them. And then I from see. there, the panel chose three from that large pool. Do you know if any of the three that the panel chose were the three top vote getters from the public? I don't believe so. Ah. Uh, actually, I think maybe one of them. Maybe not, one. Sorry, I, I don't quite remember. I think one of them might have been. I heard one of the designs that the, was voted on was that included an image of Mother Cabrini. Is that true? Sorry, images of what? <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> Mother, Mother Cabrini. <laughs> just. Um, you know, we have these votes and these processes and then the public is told that they've got input Yeah. and then it ends up not really. The top public votes were forwarded to the panel, but yeah, yeah that is how it was organized with the panel choosing the three. Oh. So the, the public vote functioned as kind of an additional panelist in that, you know, those three yeah. were part of consideration. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank, Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Um, and we will now begin uh, to proceed with our votes uh, to approve pre-considered LU 576 for the uh, 6003 8th Avenue rezoning relating to the property in Council Member Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. The application seeks approval for a zoning map amendment changing an R6 district within a C13 overlay to a C42 district. The proposal would bring an existing three-story commercial building into conformance with zoning. Council Member Menchaca is in support of this district. I now call for a vote to approve LU 576. Uh, Council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aye. Council Member Levin. I vote aye. Council Member Lansman. Aye. Council Member Gordenchik. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. 
A vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The item is approved and referred to the full land use committee. Uh, this concludes today's meeting, and I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course the council and land use staff uh, for their great work uh, in attending today as well. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.